from Europe to Latin America. And we will be looking now at a video about the Liceo Tecnico Profesional La Florida in Santiago de Chile. And following that, there will be an, a comment by Christian Cox. Um, I think we're very lucky to have this presentation. And I think you may surprise the audience with some of uh, the comments that you will make um, uh, after we see the video. Uh, but Dr. Christian Cox is head of the Center for Research on Educational Policy and Practice at the Catholic University of Chile. Previously, he was the director of the Curriculum and Evaluation Unit of the Chilean Ministry of Education from 1998 until 2006, from where he led the design and implementation of the curriculum reform of the schooling system of Chile during the 1990s. <laughs> un terreno heriazo, eh, existía un objetivo de muchos dirigentes sociales de mejorar esta zona. Eh, viendo las necesidades principales, surgió la idea de un liceo de educación medio, un técnico profesional. Eh, eh, nosotros quedamos gratamente sorprendidos cuando nos movilizamos del lugar provisorio, cuando esto recién estaba funcionando, eh, generó inmediatamente como una paz para los chicos. Acá en el colegio el bullying ha bajado bastante. De hecho, ya el año pasado se registraron casos muy aislados de bullying y este año ya ni tenemos. Porque se abre el espacio, lo, la gente puede convivir, los más chicos con los más grandes, y es lo que da nuestra infraestructura. Este recorrido de caracol que ellos hacen para descender en los recreos, este ojo que está acá, que la luz entra por todas las ventanas de las salas de clase que ilumina todas las salas de clase y nunca hay oscuridad al interior de ningún espacio. No está diseñado para que nos llegue la luz, ¿no? el edificio ha mejorado por lo menos en educación y se ha visto también en SIMS, en pruebas de medición a nivel comunal también se ha visto. Acá no hay alumnos durmiendo en la sala, por ejemplo. ¿Sí? Hay alumnos... Eh, proactivos, que en la sala se comportan como deben comportarse, la práctica pedagógica fluye de manera natural y eso es una conquista que no ha sido fácil. O sea, yo creo que lo importante es que viene desde la base, en segundo lugar que respondía a una necesidad muy latente en, en, en el sector y en tercer lugar que el proyecto se fue gestando eh, sobre la marcha, ¿eh? el proyecto educacional, educativo. Bueno, nosotros los estudiantes lo bautizamos como el elefante blanco, nos daba mucho para imaginar, también lo bautizamos como el barco porque en la punta se hace una proa. Entonces al principio nosotros igual imaginábamos con el colegio. Era bastante lindo y no sé, igual fue emocionante cuando llegamos acá al liceo. Que vivan los estudiantes, jardín de nuestra alegría. Naves que no se asustan de animal ni policía Y no le asustan las balas ni el ladrar de la jauría Caramba y samba la cosa, que viva la astronomía Thank you very much for that introduction And my most sincere thanks for, to the OECD Center for Effective Learning Envi <coughs> Environments, CELE For <coughs> inviting me to be part of this celebration of the best architecture at the service of education in the world. Not being an architect, uh, nor a head of a school, and a bit owed by my colleagues here in the, in the podium, I'll try to contribute from my experience as, as in educational policy in Chile. I'll first contextualize the video on the Chile project then refer to the larger policy context in which that project took place to end up raising some general points on the dialogue between architects and educators that the other Christian <laughs> was so eloquent about it. Uh, context. Paulo Neruda, in his Nobel Prize speech in 1971, said that he came from a country 
that was, quote, a land separated from all others by the steep contours of its geography. Unquote. You, you are seeing Chile, satellite view from the extreme north to the south. You can see how narrow it is between the mountains and the Pacific. And you can see how it gets to Antarctica. As we have just seen in the video of the Liceo Tecnico de la Florida in Santiago, we were unable to film its teachers, students, and the community because their work has, has been interrupted by a major student movement, which includes both, both lycees and universities since May of this year, constraining educational activities and in the process, stirring up Chilean society and politics. The movement's key demands, which have strong public support, are to eliminate the public funding of for-profit educational institutions, and for the state to become more proactive in funding higher education. This, in an educational system which has advanced as much as, much as any other Latin American country, in terms of quality, but has become one of the most socially segregated in the, in the region. In Chile, then, it is not only geography that separates. Nowadays, it is also education. And it, and it is the task of politics today and of educational policies tomorrow to find better answers to the needs of integration and social cohesion that the student movement is demanding. <laughs> On educational policies and school architecture in Chile and OECD, the development of Chilean school architecture in the last five decades reveals a distinct three-phase pattern. Throughout the 60s and early 70s, access to education was the paramount problem. And the building of schools was a high priority. So a standard type a standard type of construction was defined and implemented by a national central institution. The buildings, though safe and adequate for the implementation of a national curriculum, did not consider the value of diversity, nor vary it according to climate or local contexts. Neither were teachers and community considered in their planning and design phases. During the authoritarian period of military government that followed the breakdown of Chilean democracy in 1973, and particularly in the 1980s, the public educational budget fell <coughs> by a third in real terms, and a radical privatizing educational reform led to a drastic drop in school buildings. In 1990, with the return of democracy, there was a change of paradigm. State and centralized, centralized criteria were combined with those of pro-choice and competition, the dominant legacy of the authoritarian period. Over the next, next two decades, this unusual mix became the only politically viable vision for supporting both development and democracy. Education became the strategic means by which to obtain both these values, with emphasis on expanding access and improving quality and equity, supported by a fourfold increase in public education expenditure. By the latter part of the 90s, Chile approved a reform which provided a full school day for every student. And as a consequence, it implied the greatest expansion of sc school infrastructure in a century. To explain, while over the previous 25 years, Chile had achieved 100% coverage for primary education and over three quarters for secondary education, one of the best in Latin America, it had done so by organizing schools into two daily shifts of students for, per building. Now the goal and challenge was to build the necessary infrastructure for a full school day to all students. The longer school day's need was directly connected to a new curriculum, 
in its turn an attempt to answer to the new competencies demanded by modern postmodern society, i.e. economic development, modern citizenship, and personal life. In short, the high cognitive skills required by the new curriculum demanded more time. The time required for exploring and analyzing in education is greater than that occupied by lectures and dicta dictation. Essays and project pedagogy assumes longer test times than multiple choice tests or responses from closed sources like summaries or fact forms. In contract, contrast sorry, to the 1960s, there was not accepted standard architectural model now, but rather schools were built on a case-by-case -case basis as responses to educational objectives and local needs within national defined criteria and standards. A mix of centralized criteria and standards and decentralized units and capacities responsible for designing and executing them produce a, a true revolution in school architecture in the country. No single new building was the same as another, and all, all of them, close to 3,000 in a system of over 9,000 schools, complied with high nationally defined standards. The new criteria required projects <coughs> should involve consultation with educators and the local community, which meant that architects had to design <coughs> Listening to this new voice, and, and educators on the part had to think about new possibilities of relating to and working in the new buildings and spaces. Looking across these cases, a new pattern of, of architectural answers can be identified. Thus, a new vision of teaching which emphasizes teamwork, as was underlined by, by Christian, led to a redefinition of their own practice, <coughs> own spaces in schools. The new curriculum's emphasis on competences rather than declarative knowledge as the principal goal of the educational process required flexibility about how classrooms, libraries, schoolyards, and laboratories were to be used. In fact, spaces that had been largely ignored for education in previous public educational infrastructure projects acquired new uses and meanings and became essential components in the design of a new building. Lastly and most, most importantly, the prolonged exposure, almost a decade, of Chile's architectural profession to a new annual competitive bidding for school infrastructure design led to many projects bringing a combination of art and innovation to school buildings and spaces, thus structurally contributing to a richer and deeper formative experience for the students and teachers. In Chile, these five decades of evolution of school buildings are strikingly similar to the pattern of change analyzed for OECD countries in the opening chapter of the compendium. Many countries seem to have experienced a comparable journey. First, standardized design issued by a national center that seeks to optimize resources as well as the use of new technologies. Second, a change to a case-by-case -case approval approach, excuse me, where projects are contextualized. That is, they take account of the surrounding environment and the needs of the local communities and users as decisive factors in the design process. Third, a similar evolution from none to some, and then a growing dialogue between educators and architects. Fourth, both nationally and globally, similar cautionary lessons about the gaps between these two fields, and the need to effectively bridge their disciplines to achieve a better fit between educational practices and the buildings and spaces in which they are contained. My, 
third topic, if there is time. I, I would like to open up on this key relationship just, just a bit on this dialogue between architects and educators. If <coughs> architecture at, at its best has the power to generate calm and provoke imagination, where there was restlessness and anxiety, as Pedro Yanez, the student leader from Liceo La Floria, told us in the video, then its key role in education cannot be exaggerated. To enhance this power and ensure that it fits the purpose, the dialogue between architects and educators needs to be deeper. To be fruitful, a dialogue has to share a common language, common criteria, and I would argue some common values. My experience is that this common base is not always easy to find between education and architecture. Both fields have, of course, their own knowledge and principles of practices, their own core business, which do not naturally converge. When they interact at the start of a new building or on an ongoing basis, as it happened in Chile over a decade and a half, architects tend to learn about schooling by reading about education's requirements in the knowledge society, and on occasion studying the new pedagogical paradigms. And from this theoretical knowledge, start designing. This is the experience in Chile and, and in Latin America. They very rarely observe systematically how actual classes or teachers and students interact in different contexts and spaces. Their client educators, for their part, do not have any specific preparation on the uses of space and buildings in education, and neither have they developed criteria for assessing solutions in this domain. They enter the dialogue, therefore, with no more knowledge than their own practical experience, which necessarily looks to the past. And when they use the new buildings and spaces, their value and potential can often be missed, as it is in it is invisible to their untrained eyes. I know of no school of education in my part of the world that includes in its curriculum time set aside, aside for ideas about the uses of architecture to enhance the key functions of education. If this is an inevitably approximate but valid description of the knowledge basis of the exchanges between the two professions, I think two crucial questions need to be answered. First one, what is needed to produce a more fruitful dialogue? And secondly, what are the, the institutional and professional conditions that can overcome the limitations in the patterns revealed by the compendium as well as by my own country's <coughs> recent experience? I think that a fitting form of celebrating the best school architecture projects in the world is for both professions, architects and educators, to take these questions home and start working together on ways of answering them. Hopefully, we, will, we should see some fruits in the next compendium. Thank you very much. And uh, now we begin. Thank you, Christian. This cry from the heart, I think, which is very real about this gap between us still, even after so many times, so many years um, of collaboration together in meetings like this, um, and how to, I mean, pointing up just uh, why ideas are not being picked up, this superficiality of the architects and lack of expertise um, or experience of the educators in, in physical environments. And I think you really put your finger on the nail or hit the nail on the head uh, as to what we need to be doing. So thank you so much. And I'm sure there will be a big response uh, from the floor to this.